Welcome to Unit 13. We're going to talk a little bit about the electrons and their relationship to the periodic table. This makes life much easier than before when we had all of our little triangular diagram filling in 1s, 2s, 2p, all that kind of stuff. <coughs> and this actually helps us realize how the electrons influence the behavior of different elements. So section 3.8 is the one you probably take a look at before starting on this. So we're going to look at some nomenclature for the periodic table, how we can refer to parts and regions of the periodic table and the rows and the groups, all that kind of stuff in it. We're going to look at what we call valence electrons from the periodic table. Those are the electrons in the highest numbered shell. So I take the n with the highest number, count up the electrons, those are my valence electrons. And then we're going to identify some of the specific named groups on the periodic table, names you probably have heard of before in, in many cases. So. If we go back and think about the periodic table itself, I have a small one drawn up here in this corner. We have a couple things to look at. One is the rows, and so if I look across the row here, for example, the second row, like that, what happens as I go across that row <coughs> is the properties of the elements change, they change, they change, they change, they change, and when I snap back around to the third row down here, they become similar. So ones that are in these columns have similar properties. Ones as they come across are changing as they go across the table. The rows are called periods and they're very cleverly numbered one through seven. So there's period one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. These two down here, suspicious looking periods here, actually are inserted up into this part of the periodic table. So they're not a new period. They're actually parts of period six and period seven. The Elements that are in columns are called groups or families. Groups is a more common name for that. So when we number the groups, and there's actually a, a worldwide accepted way of doing that that isn't all that worldwide accepted, is we start out here with number one, two, and we just number straight from one to 18 all the way across. We'll call those the group numbers. Um, other ways you'll see on periodic tables, you see a Roman numeral of 1a up here and 2a here and then you might see a 1b. There's different ways they do it with that. I th we're going to stick to the 1 through 18 because I think it really gets rid of a lot of the ambiguity that we have to have to look at. So if I blow it up and take a look at it a little more carefully, you'll see the group numbers up here. 1, 2, 3, 4. You'll also see the period numbers down along here. So those are important to remember. remember columns are groups, rows are periods. So how do the electron configurations relate <coughs> to the periodic table? Because, you know, that triangular diagram thing, if you had to draw an electron configuration or something that had 58 electrons, you'd be at it for a while, making sure you got up to 58 and had everything filled in. So what do we actually do with it? Well, here's what we do. Uh, if I think about the electron configuration elements in the same group, okay, there's a similarity to those. As you go down the group, the period number increases by one. That means its shell number increases by one. So, for example, um, if I here I have lithium, hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium. Let's go back to the previous slide. And so here's hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium. I keep going through rubidium and cesium and francium if I wanted to. What you find out about these elements, you look at them as they're going to a different group number. These really are kind of shell number there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Those are the highest n numbers you're going to have <coughs> for elements in that period. So I look at hydrogen and I write his electron configuration using the old way. <coughs> if I draw a triangular diagram, run it through, hydrogen has an electron configuration of 1s1, lithium is 1s2, 2s1. Sodium is 2s2, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1, and potassium is that 4s1. So what you notice about these is they all end in s1. You also notice that they end in 1, 2, 3, 4. So again, if I go back to periodic table, here's hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium. They all end in s1, and they end in 1s1, 2s1, 3s1, 4s1. If you were guessing, what would you guess rubidium would end in? Uh, probably a 5s1. Huh? The only thing to notice about the periodic table as you look at it is these are two groups here, kind of similar to each other, kind of standing off here to the side. On this other side, boron, carbon, nitrogen across here, this whole area in here, if you count those up, that's one, two, three, four, five, six groups. Across here, you'll have 10. If I 
you have to draw, you'll have 10 across here. And over here, you'll have 14. So go back and think about that. 2, 6, 10, and 14. Where have you seen those before? You've seen those as a maximum number of electrons you can put in S, P, D, and F elements. So what's really happening in the periodic table is here we're filling in the S subshell. Here we're filling in the P. Here we're filling in the D. And here we're filling in the F. <coughs> so it's very nicely laid out. Go back and remember that the periodic table is based on properties. Mendel, back in the 1800s, they didn't even know about subatomic properties. They didn't know atoms were, were indivisible, were, were divisible. They based it all on properties. Then we come back with this little fancy, elaborate, sophisticated uh, electron configuration approach, and all of a sudden it lays right on top of the properties of the elements. And so it's a fairly quick way for us to get periodic, to get the uh, um, electron configuration. The other thing I might point out is we have something called valence electrons. Valence electrons <coughs> are the number of electrons in the highest numbered shell of the atom. So for example, if I go to lithium here, oops, wrong thing, didn't hit the, go to lithium up here, he ends in 2s1, he has one valence electron because there's only one electron out there. If I go to beryllium, what's going to happen is these guys will all end in s2. So beryllium will be end in 2s2, 3s2, 4s2, all the way down the road. If I come over here into my P's where I'm filling in, if I look at nitrogen, for example, his electron configuration will look like that of helium, but then you'll have 2s2, 2p3. Okay, and so when I look at his electron configuration, nitrogen is going to have 2s2, 2p3. That's five valence electrons. Notice that that five is the same as the last digit in that group number. So that last digit in the group number gives me the number of valence electrons that I've got, particularly in these groups, those two and these six over here. <coughs> so everybody in the same group has the same number of valence electrons. The number of valence electrons is just the same as the last digit in the group number. And so phosphorus, since he's in group 15, he has five valence electrons. Strontium in group 2 has two valence electrons. Gallium, group 3, has three valence electrons. It just kind of keeps going. This works well for elements in groups 1 and 2 and 13 and 18. <coughs> the others become a little bit more problematic. And so you look at 1 and 2. Here are groups 1 and 2. And here are 13 through 18. In here, it gets a little bit dicier sometimes because funny things happen in electron configurations. And then, as scientists are wont to do, we decided we had to name some parts of the periodic table, so we've done that. What you'll find out is the ones that I have boxed out here in blue, so groups 1 and 2, groups 13 through 18, and then actually these elements in here count as well. These are called representative or main group elements. Transition elements are the ones in the red box, the ones in here. What they're doing is they're transitioning from S's to P's <coughs> for some of the higher atomic numbers. And then uh, down below is the in the green is the inner transition elements. These are the ones that are uh, sort of inserted in the periodic table inside of here. I might notice note we also have the periodic table filled out now all the way out to 118 elements. Uh, we keep synthesizing new elements, making new elements. They aren't overly productive in the sense of what are you going to do with them at some point because they generally make only a few atoms of them and they don't last very long at all. But we are up to 118 now and following right along with our, what we already know about the periodic table. And a few more named regions to look at. We have some specific ones. If you look at this group here, the blue guys in here, those guys are called the alkali metals. Uh, hydrogen is really not an alkali metal. I shouldn't have put that box on there. It should be lithium, sodium, all the way. Hydrogen's kind of schizophrenic. He can go either way. You mean metal or non-metal. But these guys down here are the alkali metals. It means when I throw them into water, <coughs> when I throw them into water, they're going to actually uh, form uh, a base. A base is alkali. Alkaline batteries, those are base-based, base-based. Alkaline batteries are developed around the concept of a base in, in solution. The ones in group 2 
are called the alkaline earth metals, and mostly because they'll also form a base in water, but they mostly are found in the earth in minerals and all things like your calciums. Your calciums, your bariums, your strontiums are found very often in minerals and things of that nature. Group 16 over here, the green one, is called the chalcogens. Those are, it means chalk forming. Put them in, uh, calcium carbonate, chalk itself, uh, it has oxygen inside of it. If you look at the yellow one, these are the halogens, fluorine chlor halogen headlamps. You've probably heard of that. That's what you're looking at in here. These elements is part of that system. And then over here in the last group, we have the noble gases. <coughs> Noble gases used to be called the inert gases, but then about 1962 they found out they could actually make a compound with xenon uh, inside of here somewhere. They could make a compound with xenon, which meant it no longer was inert or not reactive at all. It did react, and so they changed it to noble, meaning, yeah, okay, they'll react. They're not really good, happy about it, but they'll do it. And here, if we talk about metals, non-metals, I threw another category in metalloids. And here, there's a stair-step line down the periodic table that looks like this. What that does is separates metals over here on the left-hand side from non-metals over on the right-hand side. Now, if you think about metals, what do you know about metals? You, you know famous metals, probably copper. Uh, look at steel. Uh, look at things of that nature. Those are metals. And metals do things like they conduct electricity. They tend to conduct electricity, uh, they'll, they'll heat, conduct heat well, uh, that's sort of thing, they're malleable, meaning you can beat them into different shapes, and they're ductile, meaning I can draw them out, I can heat them up and stretch them out and all. The nonmetals on the other side are typically don't have those properties, so oxygen, for example, is a gas at room temperature, sulfur is a solid, but it's not, <coughs> it's almost a, it's a powdery type of solid, you can't take and form a different kind of shape out of it in the end. And the group down here I threw in called the metalloids. These are really the ones that are across the stair step along here because those guys can act like a metal or non-metal depending on what the circumstance is. Um, so that's another category that we'll deal with once in a while. When we start talking about compounds, particularly ionic compounds, we'll talk about reacting metals and non-metals with each other. And that's where it becomes important. If you have a hard time remembering that, I thought maybe this might help. I'll bring up this periodic table again because I kind of like it. Looks like that. And that periodic table, uh, by the way, Einstein is not an element himself. That's one that's named after him. But if you look over on this side of this periodic table, what you see is you see things that look like metals, don't they? And this kind of neat table, you can hover over it, and it'll tell you things about the atomic weight and the density and the melting point. If you click on it, it gives you even more information about what it's used for and things of that nature. I think it's kind of fun. These are all metals over here, but notice what happens. Here's my stair-step line coming across here. Okay, and what happens? Well, as I get in my stair-step line, you know, this is a gradual difference between these guys in here. But as you get a little bit further over, what you see is these guys very much do not look like the metal side <coughs> at all. <coughs> so if you get this visual in your mind, it'll be easy for you to remember metals are on the... Oops metals are on the uh, left hand side and non-metals are on the right hand side okay um, okay I think that was all I had for that one so let me go back here looks like that and that is our coverage of that so now here's the thing that you get if you don't get anything else out of the whole section which you need to get out of that section some of the terminology but you also need to get down the idea that the group number, the last digit of the group number, tells us how many valence electrons I have. Because that's going to be coming up big time when we start talking about writing formulas for compounds and naming compounds.